Shalom, Shalom. Shalom. So, well, you know, we were talking this morning about uh, some things, good things that would be good to bring up this morning. One of the things that really stuck out to me was why Hebrew? Why is it important to learn Hebrew? Why is, why is Hebrew important? And you made a good comment. You said, why is English important? And I wanted to give an answer to that. Why is English important? The reason that English is important is because it connects you to the world that you're living in. Right? English connects me to my family. It connects me to my community that I live in. I go to the grocery store. I can purchase things. Um, I can go do business at City Hall or at the court. All of these things, I'm able to function in this world that I live in because I know the language. English connects me. And that's the job of language. Language connects you to a certain world or a world being. Hebrew is the language of God's people, Israel. Hebrew is the language that God chose for his covenant with Israel to be passed down in. It's the language of the scriptures. Everything that we read in English in our Bibles is just a translation. It's, it's a veil, if you will, between us and between the original text. But this is the language of Yeshua, the language of the disciples, the language of the world that they lived in. And if we carry Yeshua in our hearts, <coughs> and if he, is, if he is the boss of our life and we've been grafted into his people, the more that we can learn the language, the more that we are going to be able to enter in and be connected to Yeshua's world. Yeshua's world is the scriptures. He is the word made flesh and the word was passed down in God's providence in Hebrew. And so the more that we can learn and, and everybody has different capacities and different capabilities. But you know what? Start. How does a mouse eat an elephant? One bite at a time. You may not ever become an expert, but I promise you every single little nugget that you learn from the Hebrew language is going to be special. It's going to be a little piece of treasure in your heart, and it's going to help to connect you to the world of Yeshua, our King. And I can tell you now <clears throat> that when the Master returns and sets up his kingdom in Jerusalem, right now the language of the world is English. English runs the world <laughs> because it's the language of the, of the most powerful nation in the world. Well, in the days of Yeshua, the most powerful nation in the world will be Israel. And I would not be a bit surprised if Israel, if, if Hebrew becomes the language of the millennial reign, becomes the language of the days of Messiah. And certainly for us, for those who are his, now it may sound different than it does today, but you know what? Start rehearsing and start learning because this is the language of the kingdom. So we want to connect to this world that we've been grafted into. That's why it's important. And also I would say, that's why learning the prayers of Israel are important because it's the world that God's people live in. These prayers are all from the scripture. They're all from Hebrew. They're biblical ideas. And they are, they are the, the life cycle. You know, imagine, Imagine being a donkey in a cart and going around and around and making paths and making a rut in the ground. You've done this path so much, but it's familiar to you. It's your path that you walk on. Well, the prayers of Israel is the path, the path of righteousness, if you will. It's a part of that, of your, your life cycle, of what you hear day in and day out, hearing prayers to God, reciting prayers to God. And this was Yeshua's work. And if he lives inside of us, then we can, become, we can become familiar. And I guarantee you, when Yeshua rebuilds the temple, when he returns, guess what? The Levites are going to be standing in the temple just like the days of old. And you're going to be hearing these songs. You're going to be hearing a lot of these prayers. And this is all rehearsal. This is us preparing ourselves today to live in the kingdom that is come. So it's, it's all about connection for us. 
So I wanted to share. There was something that was dropped on my heart just last night after some more conversation that we were having. And I was sharing with my family yesterday that uh, every now and then, and anybody can relate to this, I think, you know, you'll go through a day where all of a sudden you'll see a number or a phrase, and you just see that number or that phrase pop up all day long, and you wonder, wow, is this coincidence or is this something? God, are you trying to tell me something? And he might very well be. But this happens to me on occasion. And yesterday, I happened to see a particular number multiple times. And that number was 358. I saw it in different contexts, and I saw it several times. And what's significant about 358? Well, to me, what came into my mind when I kept seeing this number is an interesting an interesting function of the Hebrew language. In the Hebrew language, every letter of the alphabet is equivalent to a number. And in Hebrew, this is called gematria. And so every word in Hebrew, by extension, has a numerical value. Right? Well, you know, if I was to spell out my name, Garrett, in Hebrew... Gimel, Reish, Tav. I could add up those letters and my name would have a numerical value. Just so happens to be 603. But the number 358 happens to be the numerical value for the Hebrew word Mashiach, which is the Messiah. That's an important Number, it's a significant number in Judaism and in biblical, you know, in, in Jewish thought. 358, because it's the number of the Messiah. And I kept seeing this number. I was like, wow, Abba Father, are you trying to tell me something? So I shared that with my family last night. And mom mentioned that it sounded to her like a ton, 358. That's like what we would say on when you look at a clock and you say it's 358. And what's that signify to you? It's two minutes away from four o'clock. And mom asked me at the time, she said, well, what's the significance of the number four? And I said, well, that four equals the letter Dalit, which in Hebrew, the word Dalit or Delet means a door. You know, so, so we, you know, we were playing around with numbers last night and, you know, you know, trying to see, you know, meanings and, you know, trying to, um, trying to discern, you know, if there was some, maybe something that God was trying to tell us. Well, after that conversation, everybody was going to bed and then I was upstairs and all of a sudden there was just some things that just dropped in my heart. And it was all wrapped around this conversation we had had about the Messiah and the door. And that's what I wanted to share about today was this what was just on my heart. <clears throat> And I think some of this will be uh, preaching to the choir, but praise God, it's recorded. Um, so, and but I think this is an important work for the time that we're living in. So, I'll start off by telling you: a couple weeks ago, I loaded up all the cardboard. We just moved here, and we had loads of cardboard boxes. Well. Thank God, just a mile up the road, there's a recycling drop-off at the library parking lot where I can drop off all of that cardboard. So one day, a week or two ago, I loaded up all the cardboard, drove it to the library, and I was bringing it over to the dumpster to drop it all off. And there's another man dropping off his recycling. And as I approach, he looks at me and he says, do you think things are ever going to go back to normal? And I knew what he was talking about. He was talking about when is Clay County going to start picking up recycling again so that we don't have to bring it to a drop-off location? And I don't have the answer to that. But his question really stuck with me that day. It really stuck in my heart. Will things ever go back to normal? That's the goal of so many people now 
in this post-COVID world that we live in, right? COVID, this pandemic has been raging for what, two years now? And it's changed the way that so many people live. And I hear so many people express and say, I can't wait until things go back to normal. But in one sense, I don't think God wants things to go back to normal. To so many, when they say that, ah, let's just get back to normal. It really means let's go back to our old way of living. When we lived our daily life, day in and day out, without concern for this pandemic, we lived in blissful ignorance, and we just did what we wanted to do. We did our normal life. But for so many, that normal life was living day in and day out without a thought of the Messiah. Without a thought that one day the Messiah is coming soon. People living like they're asleep. And not expecting every day, Yeshua may return soon. I need to get ready. I need to prepare for him. So many of us live in this lull. And for so many people, that's normal. And I'm not really talking about the world. I'm not talking about all kinds of people. I mean, I'm talking about believers, people who claim to follow and love Yeshua. This is how we live. That's been, that's been the normal, at least here in America, for God's people, for those who claim to follow Yeshua, is this lull. When can we get back to normal? And I think that's a normal that God doesn't want his people to get back to. So this COVID world has been, for the last two years, a time of quarantine. And people, whether it's out of fear or caution or good sense, or whether they've been forced to do it, they've been shutting their doors and hiding themselves away for periods of time. And I found it ironic that shortly after the man asked me his question just this past week, our family's been in quarantine, right? We had a bout of it go through the house. And so we had to shut our doors and kind of hide away from the community for a time. And that left me thinking this week about my own question. That man at the dump asked me his question. Here's my question to myself. And it might just be God's question for many people. While I had to shut away myself behind my door, and while COVID has ruled our lives for two years and we've been in this state of quarantine, have we learned anything? Have we gotten quiet with our maker and learned from him? Have we allowed God to teach us the lessons and change our hearts in such a way that when we come back out from behind those doors, we are changed. Because if we open our doors and we just go back to normal, and I'm speaking about God's people here in America as a whole, people who claim to follow Yeshua, we just open our doors and just seek to go back to normal. And when I say normal, I mean living a life as if the Messiah is coming maybe 2,000 years from now. Hopefully not in my lifetime. There's a lot of people who don't want Yeshua to return. Because they have a life to live. They have a normal to live. And if we just go back to that normal, what good has been accomplished through all of this? And there's been so much pain and suffering in two years. Just our family can attest to that. So much suffering and loss. And of all that, you just look at all of that and go, what good can come out of all of this? Well, there is good that can come out of all of this if we leave this state of quarantine, allowing God to change our lives to live in a way that we haven't been accustomed to living before. I don't think God wants things to just go back to that normal. I think the Messiah, you want to talk about us in quarantine? I think the Messiah himself has been shut behind a door 
for 2,000 years now. And he is ready to come out from hiding and receive his bride. Can you imagine? Can you imagine putting a ring on the finger of the woman that you desire most to be with and then having to leave and go away for 2,000 years with this feeling, this pent-up feeling of anticipation and longing and desire for your bride? Let's put ourselves in the shoes of Yeshua for a moment. And think about how much he must feel being in heaven, longing to come back for a people who desire him as much as he desires them. So Messiah has been shut up for quarantine and he's ready to come out. He's waiting for the time when he can return to earth and claim his throne in Jerusalem, his rightful throne, and claim his people for himself. And what is stopping him? Is it, is it God's infinite wisdom and timing? Is it just that God has a plan and, and Yeshua just has to wait this length of time? God is sovereign and he has a plan. But I think there might be more to it. We might have a part to play in bringing about the coming of the Messiah. And I want to read this to you. This is from 2 Peter uh, chapter 3. And it's a few verses so I'm going to read to you, but just listen to this. First of all, understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, following after their own desires and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Ever since the fathers died, everything goes on just as it has from the beginning of creation. You hear these scoffers? They're just used to normal. They said, we just live our lives like we want to live. And we've been waiting and waiting and waiting for the Messiah to return, and he has not come. These people are just used to living as normal. And these scoffers, when they hold to this idea, it escapes their notice that the heavens existed long ago. And the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And through water, the world of long ago was destroyed by being flooded with water. But by the same word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved, kept, kept in reserve for fire, kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of ungodly people. So Peter is saying here, the generation of the flood lived a long time in a state of normal until waters opened up from the deep and waters came down from heaven and drowned so many who were not prepared, who had not prepared themselves to enter into God's shelter that he provided through Noah and the ark. They were just living their lives, doing what they wanted to do until the floods came and swept them away. And so it is today. There is a period of judgment that is assigned to the earth. And so many today are just living as scoffers and saying, it will not come. And Peter is here reminding the audience, Kepha is saying, it came once, it will come again. And don't forget this one thing, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, like some consider slowness, but he's just being patient toward you, not wanting anyone to perish, but for all to come to teshuvah, to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief when you don't expect. On that day, the heavens and the earth the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will melt, and the earth and everything done on it shall be exposed. And since all these things are to be destroyed in such a way, what kind of people should you be? This is the key. Live your lives in holiness and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. In that day, the heavens will be dissolved by fire and the elements will melt in the intense heat. But in keeping with his promise, we look for new heavens and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, 
while you are looking for these things, make every effort to be found in peace, spotless and blameless in him. Now listen to this. And Kepha is not expressing some foreign thought to the Judaism of his day. This is a thought that <laughs> is, is expressed so often even today amongst the Jewish people. Hastening the Messiah. Hastening the Messiah. That if all of Israel will gather together in unity and in love and guard God's Torah, keep his commandments, love one another, offer prayers to God, seek righteousness earnestly, then those actions are hastening and bringing about more speedily the coming of the Messiah. And here is Kephi, here is Peter saying that these things that we hope for, the coming of the Messiah, the, the judgment that will make things all things right, right? We see so many things happen on this earth, in this life, that, are, that seem unjust to us. And we go, how is that fair? It is fair in God's eyes because there will come a day he will sit on his throne and those who have done unjustly, those who have done wickedly, they will be brought to justice. There is a resurrection. There's a resurrection for those who are righteous and there is a resurrection for those who are not. And that is justice. And we look forward to these things. We look forward to the time when the Messiah Yeshua will reign on earth and we will rule with him. And we can live in such a way to speed up those days, speed up their arrival. So if we just go back out of our doors in quarantine and just live like normal, live like Yeshua might not ever come. And we don't really want him to come. God forbid we may just be delaying his coming. And God forbid he may come, but it may happen at a day that we're not ready and not prepared. We don't want either of those things to happen. We want to live in such a way, a holy, godly life, that will speed it up. Speed up the coming of the Messiah to make things right and rule over us. I mentioned earlier the, that the idea that the Messiah Yeshua is waiting behind a door. That he's in quarantine for 2,000 years. Well, listen to what Yeshua says. He says this in Revelation chapter 3. And he's talking to... The, uh, the assembly, the community of disciples that was in Laodicea, was in Asia Minor. He said, I know your deeds, that you're not cold and you're not hot. And I wish you were either cold or hot because you're lukewarm, stagnant, and neither cold nor hot. I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. For you say, I'm rich. I've made myself wealthy. I don't need anything. But you don't realize that you are miserable and pitiable and poor and blind and naked. So I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may dress yourself. And so the shame of your nakedness will not be revealed. And I sap to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and shoo, return, repent. And then he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. So often I remember growing up in church that when I heard that verse read, that Yeshua is standing at the door and knocking, it was always used as a personal invitation for someone to salvation, to receive Yeshua as their master and as their savior. Keep in mind, and that's not necessarily a bad way to use that verse, because I believe Yeshua does invite, he does knock on the door of people's hearts. But keep in mind, Yeshua is speaking to people who had already claimed him to be their master. He says, I'm knocking, I'm knocking. And the, the, when Yeshua is using this imagery of him knocking at a door, He's referring to the Song of Solomon. And there's a text in the Song of Solomon, which is this love story of, of God's love for his people Israel. And sometimes they respond to his love and sometimes they don't. And, and the, the bride in the story, there's a passage where she says, 
I'm asleep, but my heart is awake. The bride is asleep. And then she says, my love is knocking at the door. Banging at the door. Come out. Come out to be with me. And what is the bride doing? Sleeping. Sleeping. And here's Yeshua in Revelation chapter 3 saying, Assembly of Laodicea, you're asleep. You're living just in your normal life, doing what you want to do, not concerned about deeds, not concerned about clothing yourself with the fine linen that is good deeds and love for your neighbor. You're just concerned about living your own life and thinking, <coughs> excuse me, thinking, I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I've got it all. And Yeshua is basically saying to them, you are asleep. And here I am, banging on the door, trying to wake you up. Open the door and let me in. Let me come in. Let me fellowship with me again. And I will submit to this generation, to, to us, to our family, to this nation, to the body of believers, those who are walking after Yeshua. Yeshua is knocking on the door of every generation, and he's knocking on the door of this generation, saying, let me in. Let me in. Welcome me back. But his bride has been lulled to sleep, living comfortably among the nations. What will God have to do to wake up this sleeping bride and cause her to want Yeshua, cause her to live in a way <coughs> that invites him down from heaven? I would say, I would submit that this COVID world that we live in, all of this COVID mess that's been going on is a shofar call to this generation that normal is not God's desire for those who claim to love him. <coughs> Normal's been tolerated for a long time, but it's not his desire. It's not his greatest desire. So let it come as a message to us when we step out from quarantine, when we return to life, woe to us if all we do is just return to normal. Let our coming forth be like a butterfly from its cocoon. Let this quarantine be like a cocoon. And we can come out like a butterfly after we've spent this time alone to transform. Let it be like the bride who comes forth from her wedding canopy. To receive her bridegroom. So what can we do? What are some practical practical things that we I'm not I'm just I'm not just speaking to us here in this room. I'm just speaking we as a collective, as a as a people who love God, love Yeshua. What can we do? First off, I would say each and every one of us needs to begin asking the question daily. What can I do today to speed up the coming of the Messiah? What can I do? Right? Kepha said living a godly and holy life, spotless and blameless, helps to speed up the coming of the Messiah. What does that look like? It's, it's one of the, there's a, there's a, a portion of the prayer service. It's called the, the 13 uh, statements of faith in Judaism. And one of them says, Anima Amin. I believe with complete faith. We'll talk about faith in a minute. I'll remember that. What is faith? In the coming of the Messiah. And even if he tarries, <coughs> excuse me, every day I will wait for him. I'll make myself ready for him every single day. For so many Jesus followers who live among the nations, it's just not a reality for them that Yeshua, Jesus, he lived as a Jew. He died as a Jew. He will return to the earth and rule as king of the Jews. He will rebuild the temple of God. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. The nations will flock to Jerusalem to learn Torah from him, as Isaiah chapter 2 says, and to pay respect to him. As Zechariah 14 says. And, and we just grew up not knowing about any of that. 
We thought, well, just when we die, we go to heaven, and that's what happens. But there's coming a day when Yeshua, the king of Israel, is coming back to restore Israel as head of nations. <clears throat> we need to get ready for that today. We need to prepare. So many Yeshua followers among the Gentiles do not see the truth of Acts chapter 15. Read that chapter. It was never meant to be that Jewish people accept Yeshua as the Messiah and then become Christians. Forsaking the Torah, forsaking the traditions of their fathers. No, it's the opposite. Gentiles who accepted Yeshua as master accept a new lifestyle on themselves. One where they forsake the customs of the world. And embrace Yeshua and embrace Yeshua's people as their own people. Why have the Gentiles not sought out to be in the synagogues where Moses is taught every Sabbath? Right? That's what Acts 15 says. That was the expectation of James, Yaakov, that these Gentiles are going to come and be among us and be in the synagogues every Sabbath. Where has that gone? <laughs> Why have the Gentiles not been grabbing hold of the tzitzit of the Jewish people and promising to walk alongside them in unity? Why so much hatred and division over the last millennia? We can have a whole other lesson on why. But the point is, in this last century, in this time, that we are living in, Messianic Judaism has blossomed at such a prophetic point in history. All right, it's no coincidence that there are thousands of Jewish people that are coming to faith in the Messiah. And, if, and they're not turning into Christians. They're living out a Torah lifestyle. And it's almost like returning to the book of Acts where it was said, I believe in Acts chapter 21. There was a testimony given to Paul that says, you see, brother, how many myriads, tens of thousands of Jews there are who believe and all of them are zealous for the Torah. That died out. That did not happen for centuries and millennia. After that point in history, when the Gentiles took over the movement, Jewish people just had to come in and start living like Gentiles. But now in these days, things are changing. Jewish people who, who love Yeshua and recognize Him as Messiah can still live as Jewish people like they should be doing and honoring the covenant of the Torah. That's happening. But Messianic Judaism is not just something for Jewish people. It is time, once again, for those of us from among the nations who claim Yeshua to follow him as rabbi, not just as savior. It's time for us among the nations to see ourselves as servants to and partners with the Jewish people. It's time for Cornelius. Remember Cornelius from Acts chapter 10? It's time for Cornelius to rise again from the ashes of history and to come in under the shelter of God's promises to Israel and to see ourselves as a part, grafted into this large community that is God's people, Israel. It's time for Gentile believers to begin rehearsing today for the time to come when all the nations will learn Torah from the mouth of the Messiah. It's time for us to display the love of Messiah for one another without a price tag. And to clothe ourselves with the fine linen that is good deeds of the Torah. It's those good deeds that smell pleasing to God. That pleasing fruit that he loves. The Messianic age will come. The days of Messiah, the millennial reign, as Christians call it, it will come. But it will come to a generation that is seeking it. Yeshua will come for a people who are longing for him. It was he who told Jerusalem that they would not see his face again until they said, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Basically, until you long for me, until you welcome me. If our generation does not see the return of the Messiah Yeshua, maybe it is God's timing. 
God is sovereign. It is, it is his plan, after all. Look, just like Yeshua said, no one knows the day or the hour, not even the Son of Man, but it's the Father who knows. Or maybe, God forbid, what if it's a shame on this generation that Yeshua doesn't show up? I don't want that to be. I don't want that to be said. And let it be said for us, at least for our family, or please, anyone under the sound of my voice, that if it is a shame on this generation, at least we shone like lights in this generation and did the right thing and lived in such a way that we longed for the coming of Yeshua. And we lived in such a way that we hurried up his coming. So let us, in this generation, join our voices together with the Holy Spirit and beg the Master Yeshua to come. Just like it says in Revelation 22, the Spirit and the Bride say, come. And let the one who hears say to the Master Yeshua, come. So I'll close with that. And you go ahead and turn the video off for me. And I'll close with that. Thank y'all.